Hello, alumni. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see you. We are going to continue to let people uh, connect. We'll give give this just a couple more minutes. We've got about 50 alumni that have registered. So we'll, we'll wait another minute or two. But in the meantime, let me just give you all a very warm welcome. It's great to see you. Looks like we've got oh, about 20 so far on the on the Zoom meeting here. John, how was your game uh, up in uh, Green Bay? Actually, people are were saying uh, uh, our friends back here in, in Albuquerque were saying we should go up to Wisconsin more often because both the Badgers and the Packers. Uh, uh, pulled it out. <laughs> yeah, so it was a great weekend. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Well, alumni, while you're waiting for this session to begin, I do invite you to add a comment uh, into the Zoom chat. Let us know where you're joining us from today. And if you're willing to also share some data that might reveal your age. You can also indicate what year you received your uh, ECE degree or degrees. We'd love to know a bit more about you. Um, and again, thank you for joining us. We'll get started in just a minute. So again, if you're willing to, to tell us where you're coming, joining us from today and what year you received your degree, just jump into the Zoom chat and add that in. Eric, thank you for starting us off. Welcome. And you're in Madison and you graduated in 97. Love it. Thank you. Well, to keep us on, on time today, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, kick things off for this December virtual town hall. Again, welcome all of our ECE alumni. We're so delighted that you are taking time out of your day to, to join us. Um, I'm Susan Hagnes. I serve as the department chair. And if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, I look forward to that opportunity in the, the near future. Uh, greetings from Madison. This is not what Madison looks like right now, even though it's December. Um, we actually have a very sunny day today and absolutely no snow on the ground. But I thought I would start you all off with a, a view that might bring back memories of, of your time in Madison if it's, if it's been a while since you were living in uh, Wisconsin or in, in the Midwest. So today's uh, theme is all about growth. Um, I'm going to shortly be introducing you to four of our newest faculty. Um, and the, the theme leading up to why you're hearing from new faculty today is uh, it's growth. So our ECE undergraduate degree programs are bursting at the seams. Uh, it's really exciting for us and we hope it's exciting for our alumni too to hear a bit about this. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, we currently offer two undergraduate degrees out of Wisconsin, one in electrical and one in computer engineering. Both of our electrical and computer engineering students have the option of, of adding on a named option to their uh, bachelor's degree, um, adding in 18 of their elective credits specifically in the area of machine learning and data science. And we're also partnering with ISYE or industrial and systems engineering to offer a college-wide certificate in engineering data analytics. So those are a couple of additional options that are undergraduates have. Both our electrical and computer engineering students all come together in a, a common core in the first year and uh, some core classes in, in their second year and beyond. And uh, we now offer um, truly interdisciplinary senior capstones for all of our um, undergraduate students. And um, on top of the richness of those core courses, you know, they get hands-on experience. Um, right from day, day one, all the way through their interdisciplinary senior capstone design courses, that all of those experiences are enriched further with extracurricular opportunities, whether that's undergraduate research or student organizations that they participate in or st student design competitions. So um, it's been really exciting uh, to see the growing interest in electrical engineering and computer engineering at Wisconsin. 
Um, our undergraduate enrollment, for those of you who haven't heard this news over the last couple of years, we are well above a thousand undergrads these days, and that's a hundred percent increase over the past decade. It's also really exciting to see that we have 160 women, um, and that is a 26% increase in our um, percentage of women uh, over the past four years. So um, we're growing and we're growing in diversity. Um, computer engineering is the ninth fastest growing major across the entire campus uh, these days at UW-Madison. And one of the ways in which we're supporting our students uh, with, with this growth is through the generous support of donors who have, have provided um, gifts in the form of scholarships this past, uh, this current academic year, we've offered $900,000 in, in scholarships for ECE students alone. Um, we're growing not only at the undergraduate level, our graduate programs have been growing. Uh, we've got about 400 graduate students right now. It's up 25% since 2016. And um, here we also have uh, been growing in terms of gender diversity. 27% of the women in our PhD program, 27% of our PhD students are women. And that's uh, a doubling over the last decade. Um, our students are supported with graduate fellowships, um, scholarships. They're engaging in, in really exciting research that's innovative and they're named inventors on uh, more, uh, more than two dozen patents on average uh, every year. So the way that we've been supporting this student growth is through faculty growth. So this year we have hit a milestone crossing over 50 tenure track faculty. Um, we have 52 tenure track faculty, eight teaching faculty. Uh, that represents about a 20% increase over the past decade. And our faculty that you can see around the perimeter of this image here, we span um, the research areas that you see in, in colors in, in the center. And so, um, we have not only been growing in faculty count, but growing in excellence and diversity. And just to give you a little snippet of some of the highlights here, you know, 28% of our faculty are women. Um, that's a huge difference from when I joined the department 25 years ago and I was one of two women faculty in the department. So we now have um, more, more than a dozen. And um, our faculty are doing amazing things. We just had, Two of our optics photonics faculty be named for the um, collectively the tenth time over the last four years to the uh, Web of Science highly cited list. Um, our research expenditures are way up over the last two years. Our faculty are not only excelling in research with recognitions as fellows in their societies and mm -hmm. National Science Foundation career awards and the like, but they're also really dedicated teachers. And we in ECE right now are proud to note that seven of our faculty over the years have, have been recognized at the campus level with Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Awards. So here are some new faces, uh, new ECE tenure track faculty who have joined ECE at Wisconsin since uh, August of 2022. And um, I'm delighted to um, introduce you to four of these newest faculty in just a moment. Uh, we've been hiring across a, a strategic hiring plan in four key areas, primarily next generation electronics, um, quantum technologies, sustainable electrical energy, and um, autonomous uh, systems and infrastructure. And um, now for the drum roll, we've got four faculty who are joining us today to give you some highlights about themselves and the research that they're doing. And again, this is something that we've been really um, uh, celebrating over the last couple of years, just the tremendous growth and the success that we've had in recruiting world-class faculty. So I'm going to be introducing you to Jennifer Choi, Jeremy Colson, uh, T.W. Huang, and Oculus Jaiswal. And I'm inviting them each to give a brief introduction of themselves and uh, some highlights for our alumni about the kind of research that they do. So we're going to kick things off with Jen Choi uh, talking about the quantum sensing work that she does. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. And thanks very much, uh, Susan, for the opportunity and introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, thrilled to be in ECE working on experimental uh, quantum technology research. In particular, uh, my group focuses on looking at sensing applications using quantum systems. And 
Uh, one of the uh, types of quantum materials we work with are just atoms in which we try to take advantage of the fact that they are sensitive to electromagnetic fields and to inertial forces. And we can actually measure the sensitivity with doing an optical microwave um, measurement. And just to show that it's not that outlandish of an idea, the idea that we can actually probe atoms directly and see them. It's uh, on the right here is a, a picture of a bunch of uh, gas tubes that are filled with no-go gases. And uh, we put them next to a Tesla coil, which, which I did to set up a new demo for a, a new special topics class uh, here in ECE on introduction to quantum sensing. And we see all of these gases light up and um, in the vicinity of this high field. And so sim similarly, yeah, we, we work in our lab on making, um, uh, preparing uh, ways to isolate, measure these atoms and some examples uh, of devices that we're using are these pictures that are shown here with the microfabricated uh, vapor cells, in this case with rubidium atoms for very sensitive magnetic field sensing. And we also use the fact that we can um, use light magnetic fields to cool down atoms to basically use these atoms for very sensitive gravity measurements. And all of these would serve um, on, on the next click, uh, various applications that include looking at very small um, uh, magnetic fields that are generated by the firing of neurons in the in, in the brain um, through applications like magnetoencephalography. And then we're also starting to explore new applications of using these types of sensors to perform uh, plasma diagnostic and next generation magnetic fusion devices, which is also fairly well integrated with other experimental programs in ECE. And a common theme in all of this is that our group are interested in making these sensors more compact and more integrated. And the way to do that is to apply techniques in uh, microfabrication and in um, integrated and nanophotonics. Um, and since uh, this is, we're, we're in ECE, a big part of, uh, what, uh, of devices that we care about are solid state devices. And, um, and we can actually similarly leverage quantum principles to make very sensitive sensors in the solid state realm. And an example of um, a direction that my group is very much interested in is to look at optically active, meaning they uh, light up optically their color centers and uh, wide band gap semiconductors such as diamond and uh, essentially treat them as analogs of atoms in the solid state and perform very similar sensing measurements where we're looking at their sensitivity to electromagnetic fields. Just to give you an example in this bottom, um, left image here, we have a uh, just a regular diamond ring that you, you buy and then you put it under UV, they light up. And similarly in our lab, we make and uh, characterize uh, these color centers in particular a type that involves a nitrogen substitution in a diamond. And I have this little video here that shows what happens when you shine a diamond crystal with these type of defects and um, with green light, and then we're expecting to see red light out. So what you see in that ring here is a color filter, and we're standing in green light, and we're seeing red light comes out. And basically what this means is that we, just by using optical techniques, we can directly look at the quantum uh, state of these um, quantum systems in, 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 in the diamond crystal. And then we can use this uh, measurement to be able to measure magnetic field. So on this uh, next, uh, image here as a, an example vector field measurements. So we're essentially using the diamond lattice to set the axis for a magnetic field measurement. And then we're using light or uh, rather the intensity level of light to basically sense the strength of the magnetic field. And in doing that, we can sensitively measure vector magnetic field uh, down to the level of nano Tesla. And at that level, this uh, system is of interest to uh, be used for, again, uh, biomagnetic sensing. Um, and we are actually right now exploring it for materials analysis in this lower um, uh, left uh, image here. And then we're also looking to using these uh, type of sensors, which are tru truly atomic scale probes to uh, look at their sensitivity to temperature to basically perform thermometry, look at small changes in temperature, let's say in cells, uh, in biological cells on the nanoscale. And uh, with that, I'm uh, happy to take questions now or later. <laughs> and thanks, thanks very much. Thanks so much, Jen. I'm going to um, make sure we leave a little time at the end for questions and our, our new, newest faculty, representative faculty will will stay on the Zoom call all the way to the end to, to uh, jump in and answer any questions you might have. So next up, I'm delighted to introduce you to Jeremy Colson. 
Um, we're totally switching topical gears here from quantum sensing to a uh, data-driven control. And so Jeremy will tell you a little bit about his, his journey to Wisconsin. Hi, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me. Thanks a lot for joining. Um, yeah, so I can tell you a little bit about myself before jumping into the nitty gritty of the uh, fun research. Um, so I'm uh, originally from Canada, uh, from Ontario, um, where I did my undergrad and my master's in uh, math. And then I decided I wanted to do uh, useful math. So I moved um, to Zurich, where I did my PhD in electrical engineering. And I just finished uh, last year and joined here um, at UW-Madison uh, this February in the middle of a, so a snowstorm. Um, so that's a little bit about kind of my trajectory of how I got here. So now I can kind of jump in to talk about what it is I do. Um, so my kind of overarching vision is, is trying to solve uh, societal scale challenges. So things, you know, we're living in a, a world now kind of dominated by data. We're beginning to see headlines in magazines and newspapers about artificial intelligence and machine learning, beating humans at uh, all the games that humans know how to play and all sorts of other things. And um, so researchers in uh, industry are both starting to adopt these technologies with the hope that, you know, we can put them into smart infrastructures, smart agriculture, smart healthcare, smart transportation. Um, but at the same time, as we're beginning to push these technologies into these, these situations, we also see some pretty scary failures, right? So we see here this self-driving car um, with a pretty nasty crash. So this tells us we're not quite there yet as a community because we still have some fundamental questions to address in this area of safety and robustness and reliability. So this is what, what my research area is in, is how we can um, bring this field of control theory, which is historically obsessed with these sorts of adjectives of robustness and safety, in with this world of AI and machine learning. Um, and so my research area is at the intersection of these two fields, um, which I call data-driven control. So kind of uh, in words, what is that? Well, I define it as, as the study of how we can use measured data to design these systems like we saw in the previous slide um, that can make smart decisions in these very complex and uncertain environments. And um, uh, just to note here, one of uh, the recent magazines from the IEEE Control System so Society that came out um, with a roadmap to 2030 indicated that one of the major developments um, in control in the past decade and one of the most important moving forward is exactly this interaction between machine learning and control. So this is the area that, that I'm working in. Um, so to go a little bit more into detail, uh, my focus is uh, threefold. So the first, uh, I'm mostly interested in, in the theory behind these things. Um, so how can we develop a rigorous theory for this smart decision-making based on data. Um, and then based on this theory, how can we design provably safe and reliable algorithms that learn to control and uh, make these systems autonomous? And then finally, um, taking these algorithms that I've designed and putting them into these meaningful applications like we saw on the first slide. And until now, my focus has mostly been on uh, robotics and power systems, energy systems in general. Um, and I guess some of the fundamental questions within this realm are how much data do we need to design these provably safe and reliable algorithms? What properties should the data uh, have? How do we deal with the fact that our sensors are imperfect, that uh, the data that we might be using to try to learn something about these systems and make decisions is corrupted? Um, so I've been looking into these sort of fundamental questions and building up this theory and as you can see from this slide, applying them onto um, some robotics and uh, um, energy systems like this uh, 12 ton excavating machine, um, some, some drones and some, um, some wide area power networks. And since then, a lot of other groups have kind of uh, jumped onto the theory that I developed and these algorithms and extended them in various ways and began to adopt them uh, for various number of applications, which again, kind of 
bolsters my motivation for developing the theory because then you know everybody can use it for their own sort of application. So I've listed a few on here, um, some things like quadruped motion planning, traffic management. Uh, some people used my algorithm to win a uh, autonomous greenhouse uh, challenge where they grew tomatoes um, in an autonomous way. Um, buildings and energy hub uh, control, uh, batteries, power plants, synchronous motor drives, fuel cells, wind farms, and, and so on. So um, this is kind of a little snapshot of what it is I'm working on and let's say why it's useful for the world. So happy to answer any questions at the end, I guess. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Jeremy. And now we're going to um, switch gears one more time, the last two faculty that we're going to um, highlight here today are um, from our uh, search that we ran last year in the area of computing for autonomous systems. And so these two faculty represent a little bit more of the computer engineering side of our department. Um, and we'll proceed with uh, Sungwei Huang. We all call him TW. Uh, and he's going to present, uh, whoops, sorry about that. He'll present a little bit about his research. Okay. Hello, everybody, and thank you for your support and Susan for this opportunity. And my research makes your software run faster. Uh, that means we are creating software system trying to simplify the building of HPC, high performance computing applications. Uh, we have been always tackling the challenges around the, you know, the productivity, performance, and also the portability, which are kind of like the three most important concepts when it comes to building a software system to simplify uh, your application. And productivity means by using our system, uh, we can largely reduce the time it takes for you to finish the implementation of your application and algorithm. Uh, performance and portability, of course, means by using our system, your implementation runs on our system, will be able to scale to many core uh, CPU, GPU, and other heterogeneous accelerators. On the application front, we have been trying to use our system, applying our system research to solve uh, various scientific computing problems, such as computer ADA design, CAD, machine learning, and also quantum computings. And our research has been supported by multiple uh, funding agencies and industrial organizations. We are really uh, grateful for that. Uh, next slide, please. So one example of our system uh, is called TaskFlow. Uh, some of you probably uh, know that. Uh, this is the project being supported by NSF, uh, trying to overcome many of the heterogeneous programming challenges uh, that cannot be easily or efficiently handled by existing approaches. And one of the challenges we want to overcome is transparency, because from application developer's perspective, you really care how fast you can get things done, get, get thing done, right? You don't want to worry too much about the technical detail, abstraction, optimization, runtime control, and so on and so forth. You just want to focus your energy, your effort on the application and with the development itself instead of tedious hardware detail that our system can handle, can handle that for you. So one example is a task flow. For example, if you want to write a uh, workload that has four tasks, A, B, C, D, and A will need to run before B and C, D will come after B and C. Uh, that means that when A finishes, B and C can run in parallel. From the project itself, you only need to uh, use our system. You only need about 15 lines of C++ code to get a parallel execution for this workload. Uh, for example, you can create a task flow object and then you create a executor and then you can pay our system, hey, my job has four tasks, A, B, C, D, and A will run before B and C, D will need to run after B and C. So after you specify your workload in our system's language, you can submit it into the executor and we will handle all the scheduling runtime optimization detail for you. So as you can see from this example, it's pretty straightforward and very expressive. There's no detail from applications perspective that you have to worry about how things are being scheduled across different CPU, GPU, or other accelerator. You just need to focus on describing your application in terms of a uh, computational task graph. And because of this advantage, the system has been used by uh, quite a few people from both academia and industry. Uh, for example, the AMD Zidings, the FPGA synthesis tool is already using task flow. So if you are running your FPGA application using Zidings by AMD, then you are implicitly using task flow to help you schedule your workload. Uh, next slide, please. 
So that goes to the system side of our research. Uh, like I said, we also apply our system to multiple applications. So one of the application we are trying to do is to parallelize using our system, the computer ADA design uh, automation problem. And that is also the short for CAD. Uh, CAD CAD stands for Computer ADA Design. It's a software that help you design integrated circuits. So you will write the uh, behavior, you specify the behavior of your hardware in terms of a high level language, and you take it to the CAD tool, and the CAD tool will run architecture optimization, function analysis, circuit design, modeling, physical design, and so on and so forth for you. And as you can see, today's capacity is actually very, very high. We are talking about you know, a computational problem of tens of billions of transistors, like finding the shortest route from one uh, one end to another, then passing billions of the cities and nodes and so on and so forth. So lots of problems are really taking a lot of uh, time to finish. And one of our job is to apply our system, trying to come up with a new algorithm that we can help the industry uh, design the circuit in a much faster way. So that's pretty much uh, what we are doing so far. Uh, so I've given you a very gentle introduction about my research. Uh, I would be happy to answer any question in the end. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much, TW. Thank you. And um, last but not least, I I'm delighted to introduce you to Akhilesh Jaiswal, who um, again was a very recent uh, recruitment, it arrived in August, um, joined us in, in August like TW did. So uh, Akhilesh, I'm gonna turn things over to you. Okay. Um, thank you, Susan, for giving us this opportunity and thanks to all the LM for attending um, um, this connection. And um, yeah, so uh, I would talk about one specific project uh, and uh, that will give insights into what my lab does in general. Uh, but before I get into the details of the project, I'll talk a bit about myself. So here I got my bachelor's degree from um, Nanded, India, um, and then did my master's in the Midwest region, region in Minneapolis. Um, and then from there, I went to Purdue for a PhD. I worked as a full-time engineer at Global Foundries Malta, and then I was also a research faculty um, and a scientist with the University of Southern California, uh, first in Arlington, Virginia, um, where they have an office close to the funding agencies, and then in Los Angeles um, um, in the USC campus. And finally, I'm glad to be here in August, and I'm working on uh, multiple ways to look at how we can uh, speed up computation by using unconventional computing paradigms that go beyond the traditional paradigm of digital computing, where we are processing bits after bit. And I'll talk about one specific project with respect to this particular um, thought process of uh, looking at unconventional computing. So, uh, so the next slide. So if you look at traditional machine vision, well, there is a camera somewhere, the camera is generating millions of pixels per frame, that pixel is going through some sort of deep learning network or some sort of uh, machine learning algorithm. And then based on that, we are taking some decisions. Um, uh, the thing is, even for the simplest of the decision, we have to capture millions of pixels and those pixels have to be transferred uh, probably on from an edge environment into a cloud environment, and then the processing has to happen. Well, turns out biology works in a different way. So if we look at retinal science, retinal science has uh, has evolved over years. And uh, Susan, if you can click once. So there is a long history of how retinal science has inspired camera technology. But the thing is, all the inspiration from retinal science that has been transformed into technology are based on late 80s understanding of retinal biology, which we study in textbook. The most recent understanding from retinal biology have not made its way to technology. And the conventional wisdom that retina is simply some passive filter doing some filtering and sending some filter data to the brain is not actually true. What we have learned in past decade of uh, experimental neuroscience in retina is that retina is a highly parallel analog processing engine that is estimated to extract 40 different very specific features from the events that are happening around us and sending it to the brain. The brain actually receives these features and reconstructs reality for us, giving us an illusion that we have a camera in our eyes, whereas what really we have in our eye is actually a very sophisticated feature extractor circuit. So we have collaborated with um, retinal scientists um, who experiment with live retina. They figure out what kind of computations are happening in the retina, and then we transform them into circuits that can be manufactured on a chip and could become the next generation of cameras for autonomous systems. Uh, so on the next slide, um, here is um, essentially telling that, well, 
there are multiple features that the retina is extracting. For example, object motion. Um, essentially, if object is moving, the retina knows that something is moving. If something is about to hit us, the retina knows something is about to hit us. The only reason we can hit a baseball is because in real time, retina is predicting the trajectory of the object that is flying through space. And all these computations are done by various layers of cells in the retina. And uh, the good thing is, um, recently we are hearing a lot about 3D heterogeneous integration for chips, which allows us to basically create this computing on different layers and stack them together so that we can end up having a coherent computation similar to the retina. So here is one example of a feature that retina extracts called object motion sensitivity. Essentially, if you are uh, taking a jog through, a, through a, a trail or something and you see an animal moving, well, while you are running, the entire receptive field is moving. And despite the fact that the entire receptive field is moving, if an animal moves, you can easily identify a moving animal. This ability of retina is called object motion sensitivity. It can differentiate moving objects in moving environment using a very simple circuit. So we looked at the circuit again from experimental neuroscience data and then created analog of solid state circuit using transistors and VLSI chip design techniques. So now our cameras can have this ability of object motion sensitivity. Another example uh, would be, um, uh, Susan, if you can go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. uh, the approaching threat. So if an object is thrown at us, even before the brain can identify that there is an object that is thrown at us, retina identifies that there is an approaching threat and signals the brain to get out of that location. This ability of retina is called loom detection. In fact, neuroscientists have an experiment where they took a rat and kept the brain of the rat and the retina of the rat intact, but only disabled the looming detection circuit in the rat. And the rat significantly loses its ability to escape predators, which tells us that this has a survival importance in rat. It, the circuit is also found in humans. So we once again looked at the circuit. We created um, uh, you know, analogs for those, those in solid state devices using this 3D heterogeneous uh, uh, concept. And now we can have cameras that can actually sense if something is about to hit. And you can imagine that these cameras are going to be very useful for autonomous vehicles. Uh, for example, here we are showing um, on the top left, we have a car that is moving towards a, um, a, a, a road and there are runners that are running. The object motion sensitive feature of our camera can ignore everything else and can focus on the movement saying that, well, despite the entire receptive field is moving, the camera can identify that there are runners inside the frame. In the, um, in the bottom frame, we have a stationary car and there is another car that is approaching this stationary car. Well, our camera basically ignores everything else and it can identify that in this particular region, there's an object that might, about, that might be able to hit you and therefore you, you probably have to uh, 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 you know, break your system or something. So at the end of the day, instead of creating millions of pixels, we are creating very highly specific features inspired from biology, directly looking at the circuits that go inside animal retina and create a cam out of it. Um, we have a very ambitious vision for this. Uh, Susan, if you can go to the next slide. And what I would like to highlight here is, although animal eyes are adaptive, they cannot reconfigure themselves in milliseconds, whereas in circuits, we can reconfigure, which means that I can put a camera and whether the camera a camera is on a drone that is on a rescue mission or on a surveillance mission, I can reconfigure the camera in real time to basically suit the needs and extract relevant features. I just showed an example of two features. Um, there are almost an estimated 40 different features that are being extracted by the animal retina, and we plan to put more of these features inside these cameras, develop a prototype, and put them on very high-speed autonomous drone um, and reduce the power performance uh, metric that are required for autonomous systems today. Finally, I would just uh, mention right. that uh, we have one of a kind collaborative team here. Uh, we have retinal neuroscientists, we have technology demonstrators, algorithm designers, as well as system and uh, um, uh, system designers, all working on this project. And that makes this pretty exciting because you are talking both to uh, basic sciences like neuroscience, as well as to software and system designers to bring end-to-end uh, -end solution to this problem. And yeah, um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, um, Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Akilesh. Um, I have to share with uh, all of our uh, alumni here um, just what a joy it is to serve as department chair and to have the opportunity to play a role in, in bringing in these absolutely amazing faculty over the last uh, five, six years. This is my sixth year serving as chair. And, 
And, you know, I looked, I was just looking back at the participant list. You know, we've got some alumni who date back to the 1960s and some alumni who graduated in the last 10 years or so. And, and I hope that this, this brief highlight with, with four representative faculty from our, our uh, recent uh, um, uh, new members of our, our community here, that it gives you um, a lot of reassurance and, and inspiration that the students that are pursuing their degrees here are being given just absolutely amazing opportunities uh, to work with these tremendously talented faculty. So I would say that ECE is flourishing in many ways. And, and I see concrete ways in which we'll need help from our alumni and supporters to stay on this, this really positive trajectory. I wanna share with you one of our um, priorities. It's actually our number one priority right now in the department. Um, for uh, donor support, you know, we we cannot continue to be the premier department that you all graduated from without um, the generous support of of uh, alumni and friends. And and so right now, our number one priority is a Thelma Estrin Department Chair Endowment. Um, the inspiration for this name is Thelma Estrin, who was the first woman to graduate uh, with a PhD in electrical engineering from UW Madison. Turns out she got all three of her degrees here in electrical engineering. And uh, what this endowment does, uh, the target is 4 million. It generates um, about 180, once it's, once it's fully funded, it'll generate about $180,000 in invaluable discretionary funds for uh, the chair to invest strategically in ECE. It enables flexible, strategic, high impact investments. Uh, just in time to support our faculty and our students. And I can share with you just a couple of examples to date. Um, we're a little more than halfway to our, our, our target. And with the income that's been generated so far with this endowment, we've been able to support curriculum innovations, interdisciplinary capstone projects, such as a group that's working this semester on um, an underwater, some of the comp key components for an underwater uh, sensing system to then turn around next semester and compete in Sandia's um, RoboSub competition. And that is another category of examples, interdisciplinary student design competitions. You know, we have to invest in these students to, to be able to have the funds to, to participate in, in these really valuable extracurricular activities. Um, and then we've also used uh, some of the endowment funds to the income to invest in inclusive community initiatives like our Women in ECE initiative. So um, we have a, a wonderful team of professionals that help our alumni determine ways that they can have their biggest impact. And if you have any interest in exploring ways that you can further your involvement, get involved in new ways, whether it's philanthropically, with resources, with time, we've got all kinds of opportunities for our alumni to get involved uh, and, and engage directly with our students. Um, you can take this QR code and um, it'll it'll take you to our, our website where if you scroll down to the bottom of the link that this takes you to, you can actually um, fill out a form to let us know how you'd like to help. And also um, Valerie and Courtney and Tom are more than happy to, to meet with you individually to talk further about that. So what I'd like to do with the, the time we have left is open this up for a conversation. Um, I wanna say thank you all to our alumni for joining in. Um, I want to encourage you to connect with us, follow us on LinkedIn, um, follow us on, on Facebook or, or um, Twitter X or Instagram, if those are your, your favorite social media forms. But of course, you don't have to be on social media to engage with us. Um, let, me, let me open up the, the Zoom room here for conversation. If anyone has questions for Jen, Jeremy, TW, or Akilesh, um, please raise your hand, raise your, you can unmute yourself, raise your Zoom hand, or you can jump in the chat and add in a question. Um, please, let's hear from you. Well, I'll jump in. Do you hear my audio? Yeah, Gary, nice to, nice to see you, thank you. Gary Lave, I'm a 1984 graduate. That might sound rather prehistoric to many of you. Uh, I, I'm very impressed with what I see and I'm gratified to have been part of that organization. Uh, I also did research work in chemical engineering while in ECE and uh, you know had a wonderful time. So you've joined a wonderful institution. 
I do have a simple question to ask. It is not a recommendation for action, but one of awareness and possibly action. A key issue for engineering was always a, the question would arise whether the students understand the needs of society and the concept of ethical involvement and control and direction of the use of technical tools and technical knowledge in societies that are not replete with degreed engineers. So in Madison, you're in a unique environment. And as you get into the world, uh, as one of the uh, directors of ECE years ago told us, you as engineers will really be the decision makers because technology is going to become such a critical element in directing all human resources and activity. So I, I simply wonder to what extent there is a, a formal means of students introducing a discussion of ethics uh, to prepare them to deal with the question, not so much to prompt you to adopt an ethical framework that's specific to your own desires and your own philosophies. Gary, thank you for that really well articulated question comment. Um, I will uh, respond briefly and then I'll, I'll uh, ask Jen, Jeremy, uh, TW and Akila to add anything else they'd like to from their perspectives um, in, in their interactions with students. So from the department level, I, I want to um, share that we uh, intentionally integrate ethics and engineering instruction throughout the curriculum. Great example of that is in our interdisciplinary senior capstone design uh, courses where there is very explicit um, uh, ethical instruction and expectations that students consider ethical issues as they map out their their design projects for, for the semester. Um, I'm also delighted to share that uh, some of the uh, investments we've made in curriculum innovations with the, the um, gifts that have come in so far for the Thelma Estrin Department Chair Endowment I've specifically directed at um, the development of a brand new course that we're piloting this spring um, that is uh, focusing on the ethics of data analytics, uh, machine learning, uh, AI. Um, there's no more timely topic than that. And um, as in support of the new college-wide certificate that we're offering in engineering data analytics, uh, we have created, ECE stepped up, and, and took the lead on creating this capstone course for that certificate that is introducing students um, when they are finishing up their, their capstone uh, certificate, they are doing a full semester long deep dive uh, taught by a faculty member in the machine learning area of ECE whose research specializes in issues of fairness, bias, you know, you name it in, in ML, machine learning. So uh, those are two concrete examples. And, you know, again, Jen, Jeremy, Akilash, uh, TW, if you want to add anything, please feel free to do so. But Gary, I really appreciate you bringing up a very important uh, topic. Any other thoughts on that one? I'll, I'll add Jen, Jen is a faculty advisor for one of our student organizations, interdisciplinary student organizations. The, the students that are participating in um, the uh, Spaceport Cup, Amer do I have the words in the right order, America Spaceport Cup or Spaceport America Cup is one of those two, Jen? Oh, yeah, so um, yeah, I think maybe the, 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 the only thing I'll add is in terms of that, that that's other piece about connection to real world application is uh, both at the undergraduate levels, there's wonderful uh, student uh, organizations that are actually largely student driven. So the one that, Susan mentioned um, it's we were very thankful for department support and supporting these students to, to assemble a self-designed uh, rocket um, that uh, they are going to uh, drive to. So there's various competitions throughout the year, but the big one is in um, in, in um, New Mexico in uh, in June, uh, where uh, it takes place at uh, at a, an actual launch pad for 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 rockets, um, and uh, and last year was the first year that 
uh, these students were able to, as someone from UW Madison made it all the way to, to that competition stage and we're uh, looking forward to continuing that this year. And then at the graduate level, I think what I'm seeing uh, more and more is student participating in industry internship, graduate students, like the, uh, advisors being receptive to uh, students uh, participating uh, in industry internships, which allows them to then get closer to uh, societal problems and um, understanding the connection between their research and um, and and um, and actual needs in in society. Anyone else yeah. want to add to that, Akilash? Um, yeah, so I I can give one specific example. Um, um, for the project that, that I just discussed about this Latina inspired camera, uh, we have been asked multiple times, can it be used a similar thing to basically help blind people to get some vision? Um, and we looked at it, but the caveat is if we ha can help blind people, I also mentioned that these systems can be reconfigured. So in a sci-fi version, can I basically give superhuman capability with some prosthetic eye to humans, and that's a thing we have discussed in the lab. We have some initial results, but that's a thing. Um, I collectively, me and my students, we decided not to pursue it at this particular moment and to seek out advice from experts. So we are currently reaching, reaching out to the Eye Institute um, at the university and talk to doctors and basically say that, okay, here is here is what we understand what the good things can come out of this. Can you also tell us what are the bad things that could potentially come out of this in a sci-fi world? And to know both the pros and cons before we aggressively start publishing or you know uh, patenting these stuff. So I think one of the things that I usually try to encourage the students is, well, if you have a doubt about ethics, it is best to seek advice from experts rather than trying to um, you know uh, research that internally and come up with some some details. So that's one specific example where we are actually involving uh, experts uh, actively to basically get started on this new branch of the same project. Tom, I see your hand is up. You are still muted, Tom. Now you now now you're good. No, I'm here. So I have uh, something particular for Jennifer um, that uh, and this comes out of attending IEEE meetings uh, which is uh, promote of course. So uh, Frank Barnes at the University of Colorado is working on biomagnetics, electromagnetics, and he's looking at um, the effects of very small magnetic fields on a person. And I think he might be interested in your research and you might find some collaborative effort would be worthwhile. And that's Barnes, uh, B-A-R-N-E-S. And don't wait around. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks so much for that. It actually makes me look old. And, you know, I'm glad a young alumni like Gary um, talked about the ethics. <laughs> thanks, Tom. That's a great suggestion. And and Jen, I, um, I know Frank pretty well. He, um, I, I'd be happy to, to help. Um, that would be make, awesome. Make Thank that formal you. connection for you. Yeah, he's 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 uh, um, someone with a lot of a lot of really interesting ideas and and still very active in in research. Um, in what is probably his I don't know sixth decade of of research. So, yeah, uh, alumni and friends, any other questions for our uh, newest faculty? Anything else that we can we can help answer, or any other questions about the department? Yeah, Ev or yeah. yeah, Ev. Am I saying your first name correctly? Yes. Great. Yeah, well, uh, I'm more of a fossil than any of the other <laughs> alumni it, so far. I got my BS in uh, 1969, and uh, then came back to grad school in '71 got my master's in 73 and actually worked for the School of Engineering for four years after that. And I, I was one of the early uh, biomedical uh, uh, people and actually worked in the uh, medical device business for the last 50 years. And uh, I, I find it very exciting 
particularly the, the, the growth in, in uh, the biomedical research that's going on. And I guess I, I wanted to, I, I wanted to put in a plug. I know you're doing uh, over the years uh, more student projects and things to get uh, uh, people ready, but having been involved in, in uh, product development and knowing that most of the engineers in industry uh, are, are working in more development activities and research activities, uh, there's really a need, at least in my mind, to continue to develop practical skills and particularly uh, develop systems engineering skills uh, in, uh, in particular things like reliability engineering become very critical and design for manufacturing and assembly and project management. And uh, I mean, it's been my experience, even in medium-sized companies, you have many different disciplines working on a uh, on a project, and you have to have electrical engineers that can work with software engineers and mechanical engineers and manufacturing engineers. And if it's in a medical or a diagnostics business, to work with chemists. And uh, th there's a lot of different disciplines that you need to work with. And finding people that understand how to look at the totality of a project is important. And so getting practical experience is important. The other uh, big thing that in uh, product development, you don't have five or 10 year time frames to get a product out is particularly in public companies, they're worried about the quarterly results and you have to get a project out in 18 months or two years. And that really limits the new technology that you can use in a project and getting you know, people that can work under tight timeframes and manage projects closely becomes very critical. So, I, I mean, I, I, I've, uh, I'm retired now, but I've been involved with FIRST Robotics. And I think things like that are, are very critical to getting uh, people to learn how to actually uh, uh, work together in multidisciplinary teams and develop projects. So I don't know if there's a way to try to uh, get projects that go longer than one semester so you can get you know longer projects going and getting more people involved and uh, you know to try to get some exposure to everybody in areas like reliability engineering. I mean, you know, it's one thing to be able to design a circuit, but being able to know uh, what are the problems with multi-layer ceramic capacitors in high humidity environments are things that become critical when you're doing uh, uh, like a medical device for a consumer uh, application. And, you know, a lot of those things if you, you know, you know, where do you learn them? You know, it, yeah. it, particularly if you're in a small, if you're in a large company, you have a reliability engineering department and you have people that have 50 years of history that understand these things. But in small companies, nobody knows these things and you have to learn them the hard way then. Ev, thank you so much. You know, the message that you're sharing with us is is one that I hear regularly from our alumni, when our alumni talk with, share with me, you know, what has been the most impactful experience at Wisconsin for them? It's inevitably uh, one of those senior capstone des project design courses where they had to deliver something practical that works. <laughs> you know, obviously all the courses that, you know, build the foundation up to the point where they have the ability to, to, to do those, those interdisciplinary design projects, that, that's all really important. But what really sticks with them is that that interdisciplinary project experience. And they're certainly getting project management experience. They're certainly learning how, to, how to, to deliver on a timeline. And as I was saying earlier, another way in which we really um, provide enriching experiences is through this, those student organizations, the student design competitions outside of formal credit-based courses where students... Um, you know, they've got to deliver on this Badger solar car that's going to go hit the competition raceway a year from now. And you either have it working or you don't. <laughs> you know, and, 
and and it, it these these teams are very interdisciplinary. Um, the example that that Jen uh, mentioned, um, Badger Solar, um, uh, Wisconsin Robotics. You know, so many of our student organizations and student design competition teams um, are. Uh, bringing students together to talk with one another from across electrical engineering, computer engineering, mechanical engineering, industrial and systems engineering, you know, on, on and on. Um, in some cases, these, these teams even bring in students from outside of the College of Engineering who might be in computer science or physics or, or even, you know, sociology. I think at one point with the, with the Badger Hyperloop um, a team, there was a, literally a student from sociology, which is wonderful. Uh, so, um, we, we very much believe everything that you just articulated, Evan, and, and we're, we're continuing to, uh, explore ways that we can, uh, invest in, in those kinds of experiences. Um, thankfully we've got alumni who have been helping us with, uh, gifts that, that cover the costs of these, what are inevitably expensive experiences. You know, the, the more that we do with these student design competitions, um, the supplies, the resources, the the competition fees, the getting the travel to get in, get getting those teams there, you know, it all all uh, is a great investment. And um, certainly appreciate the work that you said you've done with First Robotics. That's a great organization. Any other thoughts from our team of faculty? Anything uh, else that we would be interesting to talk about? I actually have uh, a quick one if you've got a second. Unfortunately, I've got to run for a one o'clock, but I go for it. Yeah, I was very excited about all the uh, all the technical descriptions. I find that very interesting, and every time I hear that, I wish I could be more involved in each of those. I had a bunch of technical questions. I don't think there's time for those. Uh, more of I'd just like to ask, you know, how well do you guys communicate to the students? You know, what sorts of things the the new professors are doing? Like if they're looking for you know research opportunities. I think when I was uh, when I was doing undergrad and, and grad work, I was lucky enough that. I, I kind of fell into it. I had a couple of professors that I had classes for that asked me to do research with them, um, but I didn't feel like I knew well what opportunities were available or how, you know, what the different cases were, what what people were looking for help, how I could engage. Um, so again, I kind of lucked out. I'm curious if you guys do anything better nowadays to try and uh, allow students to see what opportunities are there, allow them to get excited about it and see if they have opportunities to, to do research in those areas. All right, Oculus, Jeremy, Jen, TW, how often do you mention in your classes that there are re research opportunities for undergrads? So uh, for me, I, um, I just started teaching uh, this semester. So that was kind of my first contact with undergraduate students um, uh, at UW-Madison, I mean, of course. Um, and actually two of the uh, students in my class are undergrads and uh, I'm actually working with them. The, so again, maybe it was kind of, what, kind of one of those random things that happened that, uh, you know, they're in my class. And so it, they became aware that uh, I'm new and looking for uh, students to work with and explore different directions with. But um, yeah, maybe Susan, you can uh, explain a little bit, because as far as I'm aware, I believe there's like some sort of shared folder or something where... Um, uh, faculty members are able to kind of share opportunities and that they're looking for uh, undergraduate students on particular topics. And then people are, at least within the faculty, are aware of uh, opportunities and then they can communicate those to the students. But I'm, You're again, new, right. so like, I'm not 100%. Uh, once a semester, we send out to our all of our undergrads a link to a repository of undergraduate research opportunities that are available at any given time. And, and so many of our students connect with our faculty that way, but they also connect through the types of, of course, classroom conversations that, that uh, Jeremy illustrated and Jenna. For sure. Yeah. That's yeah, a good way for head. connections. Yeah. I, yeah. So it'd be good even for people not looking for researchers, just so that the students kind of know what research is going on. Like to me, this stuff is all really cool. And even if there wasn't an opportunity, I might say, wow, that sounds interesting to me. I want to find out more. Um, and it may then in enhance, you know, entice me to take the class and then maybe make that connection. And um, so anyhow, I, I like the idea of doing that again. I feel like I lucked out as a, as a, both an undergrad and a grad student. I had two great opportunities uh, offered to me, but I wasn't looking, I didn't know that it was even available. And so um, I always kind of hope that we get uh, better communication out to the other students. Yeah. Hey, Susan, 
Yeah, um, Gary. Along the same along the same lines, um, I went to a wedding at one point when I was a freshman, and I ran into somebody who was in chemical engineering. And because of the discussion at the wedding, it turned into an opportunity for me to be a research assistant for two years and get paid for projects for, uh, at that time, Exxon and Shell Oil, which was outside of electrical engineering, but it was a great introduction to two things, chemical engineering on one hand, but also true applications. So speaking of this involvement or this attraction, does ECE have something on the website that invites other students on campus in non-technical areas as an example to consider participating in some of these projects? Um, I imagine that could be a rather fertile opportunity and also very enriching for all participants. Yeah, Gary, I, we we can always be doing more of that. Uh, one one of the concrete ways that I can think of right off the top of my head of, of ways that we get the word out to students outside of the College of Engineering is through what has historically been a, a program run through some central campus. Um, it's an undergraduate research scholars program where faculty from across campus can submit projects to a, like a central repository. And then students in their um, second year, they can apply to be scholars within this undergraduate research scholars program. And then they can select from this repository of projects. And so that's one way in which we get that kind of cross campus potential connection. Um, we do get students outside of ECE who enroll in our courses. Um, so uh, that's also a, a way that that, that familiarity um, is amplified, but there, there's certainly, an, uh, there's always a need to be uh, taking advantage of more opportunities along those lines. Um, it, it is a huge campus and I'm quite sure there are a lot of students who don't know about the exciting opportunities here for them. Fortunately, many of our faculty have faculty affiliate appointments in other departments, just given the interdisciplinary nature of the research that our faculty are doing. So um, we do have a lot of faculty connections to other departments across campus, and that's a mechanism by which we can connect with students. We do a lot of advising of, of students from other departments through those faculty affiliate appointments. Uh, Tom, back to you, I see your hand up. And then um, because it is after one o'clock central time, we're gonna close out, Tom, with your question. You, you've got the final. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a question. Okay, it's comment. A statement. And you know, I'm, my whole career has been in an industry. And if any alumni are in the industry, it might be a good idea to try to get involved with the university and students to give them guidance and maybe a job opportunity later, but to get that input from industry. I'm done. Yeah, did you did you grab that QR code when I showed it for? No. For, yeah, no. <laughs> Tell you what, we will sh we will send out the link to everyone who registered for this town hall today. We'll send out the link to our form where our um, alumni uh, can can sign up to indicate ways in which you might be interested in engaging with our students. I, I completely agree, Tom. Industry alumni have a lot to offer to our students. And if you're willing to, to uh, engage. Um, well, I, well, I did submit a question. You on, did submit a question. Yeah, I said, no, 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 I, when I filled out the registration. Oh, okay. You'll get back to that. I will get back to that, yeah. Hey. All right, well, let me take this opportunity again to say thank you so very much for this opportunity to connect. Um, we really appreciate uh, you joining us all. Huge thank you to, to Oculus, Jeremy, TW, and Jen for joining us. And, and, and we're so thrilled that they're part of ECE. Um, and we'll look forward to the next town hall and the next uh, interaction that we have to, to talk with you all. Um, go, go Badgers on Wisconsin and, and take good care through the, the end of this calendar year. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Well done. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everybody.